If you'll turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 6. We read there earlier, Acts chapter 6. We're looking at verses 1 through 7 together for uh, the charge to our deacon candidates today. As you're finding Acts chapter 6, let me tell you about this guy. His name is Bill. Not really. The story's real. The picture was, you know, Googled from somewhere. Um, he has wild hair, wears a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans, and no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for his entire four years of college, and he was kind of esoteric and, and yet very, very bright. He became a Christian while attending college. Well, right across the street from the campus of his college where he became a believer in Jesus is a church, the members of which are well-dressed and very conservative. They want to develop a ministry to the students at the college across the road, but they're not sure how to go about it. And so in the meantime, one day, Bill, this guy, decides to visit that church, and he walks in in his usual uniform, uh, wearing his jeans, T-shirt, wild hair, and no shoes. And he starts down the center aisle looking for a place to sit, but the church is completely packed, and he can't find a, a place. And so the members are looking a little bit uncomfortable, uh, all dressed in their Sunday best. But no one says anything, and, and Bill keeps walking down the center aisle looking for a seat, gets closer and closer to the pulpit. And when he realizes there are no seats, in his typical way, he just sits down, like, like right here, on the carpet, just on the floor. Well, by now, the members are really uptight. They're not really sure what's going on. There's tension filling the air. And from the back of the church, a deacon slowly makes his way toward Bill. This particular deacon is now in his 80s. He has silver gray hair. He's wearing a three-piece suit. Got a pocket watch. He's a very godly man. He's an elegant man. He's a very dignified and courtly man. And very slowly walking with a cane, he heads down that center aisle towards Bill. And, and all the members are saying to themselves, you know, you really can't blame him for what he's fixing to do. I mean, did you see that guy come in? I mean, he don't have any shoes on. How can you expect a man of his age and background to understand a college kid like that? It takes a long time for the old deacon to get down the aisle. All eyes in the church are focused on him, including the preachers, and the church is absolutely silent. The preacher doesn't dare to begin his message at this point until that deacon does what he's got to do, and everybody knows what he's got to do. When the deacon reaches the front, the congregation watches. But instead, as they, as they expected it to happen, with great difficulty, this deacon lowers himself and sits down on the floor next to Bill so Bill won't be alone in church. When the minister gains control of himself, he says, What I'm about to preach, you will never remember. But what you've just seen, you will never forget. Such should be the heart and reputation of every deacon in every local church. Amen? I want to talk to you this morning in, uh, from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And this message is to all of you. I will be addressing these three men most directly this morning. But we want to talk this morning about the grace-enabled, grace-giving, gospel-focused ministry of deacons. And you may say, well, could you not come up with a longer title? No, I tried really hard, and that's about as good as I can do. But, but it's important. I want you to understand what the ministry of deacons is all about. It's a grace-enabled, grace-giving, gospel-focused ministry of deacons. And here's the take-home truth from our passage in Acts 6. The Spirit-empowered ministry of deacons is a major factor in the health and gospel growth of the body of Christ. Let me say that again. The spirit-empowered ministry of deacons is a major factor in the health and gospel growth of the body of Christ. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Let's read it again. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic, that is Greek-speaking Jews, among them complained against the Hebraic or Hebrew-speaking Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, 
choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. Don't miss that. There's a connection between verse 6 after the ordination of these deacons and verses and verse 7. So, there's the connecting word. As a result of the establishment of the office of deacons, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests, imagine it, became obedient to the faith. The spirit-empowered ministry of deacons is a major factor in the health and gospel growth of the body of Christ. Pastor Johnny Hunt said, serving as a deacon is not just a position to hold. It is a mission to fulfill and a work to be done. Amen? This text lays out for us five reasons that the church needs healthy, active, spirit-empowered deacons. First of all, notice with me in verse 1. The church needs deacons to handle church growth. It says that in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. This is after Pentecost. We know that at Pentecost, 3,000 came to Christ. We know that by Acts uh, Acts chapter, uh, whatever chapter we're in here, Acts chapter 6, it had had blossomed. There was probably at this point perhaps as many as 5,000 to 10,000 members of the church there in Jerusalem. The church needs deacons to handle church growth in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. You see, growth in a church changes things. It just does. And it demands that we all change our ministry to ensure that all of our church family, as it grows and expands and folks come in from other places, is cared for. Amen? Hello? That'd be a good place for an amen. All right. The church needs deacons to handle church growth. The early church was experiencing the fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic words back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus told the the disciples, He said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Pentecost had happened. Jerusalem was being reached powerfully with the gospel, and the gospel was fixing to begin to expand out of that epicenter there in Jerusalem. Uh, Again, it had begun to spread into, into, into Samaria. That would happen just a couple chapters later in chapter 8. And so when the apostles in this situation, now with a, 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 a group of believers, probably several thousand large, 5,000 plus most likely at this time, when the apostles became overwhelmed by the needs of the body of Christ, they called on the church at large to add the ministry of deacon. God uses the ministry of deacons to allow a local church to grow in a healthy way so that the entire church is built up as it continues to reach out and grow and draw others in with the gospel. The church needs deacons to handle church growth. But secondly, in verse 1, the church needs deacons to protect church harmony. The church needs deacons to protect church harmony. Uh, The rest of verse 1 says that the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So it was just a regular thing. It was an understood thing that the widows of the church that were truly widows, that is, they had no family to care for them, the, the church took care of them as their own. And in this case, again, remember, several thousand people in this in this local body of Christ not all of whom spoke Hebrew, which would have been the native tongue for Jerusalem, but many spoke Greek and had had moved in and and, and come for for, for Pentecost and perhaps stayed in the area. So there were Greek-speaking Jews. They would have come uh, from all over the then-known world uh, and just, just made Jerusalem their home after Pentecost. They met Jesus there, and they just set up camp. And the Hebrew speaking Jews, local Jerusalem residents uh, who had come to faith in Christ through the church in Jerusalem. And so the issue at hand here is that there was some favoritism, apparently, toward the local widows, the ones who'd always been in Jerusalem, 
and, and, and some neglect of those widows who had come from other places and enjoined that church. Here's what you can know about the local church. Complaining will destroy the unity of the spirit of the body of Christ, and it will split a church family wide open. Amen? And that's what was going on. There was a complaining spirit. Why? Well, because there was, in fact, a neglect and a favoritism happening in this local church. The church needs deacons to protect church harmony. Thankfully, the apostles had the wisdom to immediately admit the problem and address it with a, with a solution. The creation of the ministry of deacons. You know, unity is high on God's priority list for his people. Jesus prayed in, uh, for, in, for, for, for unity of his church while he was still here on earth. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed for our church. In John 17, verses 20 and 21, he said, My prayer is not for them alone, speaking of his 12 disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me. That is future through their message. How many believe in Jesus this morning? You trust him as your Savior. That means he's praying for you. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Father, I pray for their unity. It's a big deal. And you see, deacons, men, have a huge part to play in protecting church harmony. In all that you do as deacons, may you be, as it says in Ephesians 4, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. The church needs deacons to handle church growth, but also to protect church harmony. Thirdly, in verses 2 and 3, the church needs deacons to provide for the needy. Verses 2 and 3, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. You know, what we see in Scripture is that God loves people more than anything. Aside from His own glory, He loves people. And the apostles realized how, men, how, how important this ministry to widows was. No matter their background, no matter their hometown, no matter where, what language they spoke, whether they lived there all their life or they'd come in recently, the apostles realized how important ministry to widows truly was in the life of the church, and so they made sure that their needs would be met through the creation of the deacon ministry. This truth of the importance of ministry to widows is echoed in James 1, verses, verse 27, where it says, Religion that, our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now that verse and, and what we're seeing in this text applies to all of us, myself included, amen? We're all called to live with that kind of true religion, which is looking after orphans and widows. We're all called to prove our love to God, the Father, by how we love and serve people. However, the apostles and wise local church pastors realize that they cannot effectively and consistently serve all the needs of all the church members by themselves. And that's exactly why we have the office of deacon in the local church. It's exactly why here at East LJ we have a deacon family ministry where each deacon is given the personal responsibility for specific families in our church to regularly reach out to your family to make sure that all is well physically and spiritually with you that, so that we as a church are not unaware and unable to love you as we desire to do and are called to do. Deacons, the ministry of deacon, the church needs deacons to provide for the needy, specifically here, widows. James, by extension, talks about orphans, but, but you get the point to serve the needs of all the members of the church, be it physical or spiritual needs. Well, before we touch on the last two points, this is a good place to deal with the biblical qualifications of deacons. What kind of men must deacons be? What does the Bible tell us? James just told us that we must keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. That's what true religion looks like. 
The apostles told us in verse 3, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. What kind of men must they be? These are the kind of men. They must be active dependents on the Holy Spirit. And the wisdom that He gives through the Word of God should be obvious in the lives of men we ordain as deacons. Also, Paul gives more specific details on what this will look like in a man's life. In 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 10, and also verse 12, it says, In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. I'm here to testify to you today, even as Wes has already done on behalf of our leadership, that Larry Mullinax, Adam Pulliam, and Travis Green are all men full of the Spirit and wisdom and meat and are continuing to grow in these qualifications the church needs deacons to provide for the, for, for the needy, but the church needs deacons like this, men like this, to serve the body of Christ. Fourthly this morning, the church needs deacons to prioritize ministry. The church needs deacons to prioritize ministry. Verse 2 and then the end of verse 3 and, and verse 4. It says there the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to, neg us to neglect, speaking of themselves, the twelve, the apostles of the church, to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Second part of verse 3 says we will turn this responsibility over to them, that is the deacons, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The church needs deacons to prioritize ministry. There are a couple of foundational principles that we see here. First, we can never do alone what we can do together. Each member of the body of Christ has an active ministry. They are gifted and called to joyfully accomplish in the life of the church. That's true for each and every one of you, not just the deacons, these men up here and our other deacons. That's true for everybody in the church, amen? Every member is a minister. Every Every believer is a part of the body, and think of a physical body of Christ. You, you remember the passages in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 that talk about the different members and how we all have a ministry. Uh, the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The, hand can't say to the, the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. We need each other because just like our physical body, we're all connected and we have a part to play. My big toe can't do what my index finger can do, amen? I mean, you ever tried that? Try that sometime. Thank God that people can adapt. I think of Johnny Erickson Tata, and, and it's amazing what she can do just by holding a pencil in her mouth. But, but, but the body is made to help each other. All the members work together. If a church member is not actively serving in some way, then that person is like a toe with gangrene. Now, that's a nasty picture, isn't it? It's supposed to be, by the way. You're not supposed to like the look. And you're supposed to avoid looking like a toe with gangrene. Everybody on the same page? If that's true of every church member, it's certainly true of us as leaders, deacons, servants. Uh, you see, a toe with gangrene is diseased, and it's rendered unhealthy and ineffective. And what often happens to a toe with gangrene? It ends up amputated. Second, the apostles made clear that their calling and focus, and now by extension, there are no more apostles, right? There were 12, and that was it. They were the foundation of the church. Their teaching, their, their preaching laid the foundation for the church all throughout the ages, for all the 2,000-plus years since the time of the early church. The apostles made it clear that their calling and focus, focus and now by extension, local church pastors, must remain the ministry of the Word in prayer. It was not that the apostles or today pastors were too good to serve tables or that such ministry was beneath them or somehow less than in terms of importance in the church. In fact, Scripture, scripture makes it clear caring for the needy is a vital ministry. And again, one of the two key fruits of true religion 
as James says it, that all of us should be engaging in. But had the apostles not created the ministry of deacons, again, 12 men with thousands that needed serving, then the advance of the Great Commission would have been dramatically slowed, if not perhaps come to a screeching halt, because there are only so many hours in a given day. And so under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the apostles cared for the widows by delegating the daily ministry to them, to deacons, so that they could focus on their specific calling while enabling other members of the body, namely these seven deacons that they set aside and ordained, to play a vital role in the ministry of the church. The people of God need to regularly hear the Word of God taught in the power of the Spirit of God by their pastor. And I'm blessed to serve here in a church where it was made clear from the very beginning. Uh, Tim, even from the very beginning, uh, as I met with the pastor search committee back in 2013, that the leadership wanted me to be free to give myself first and foremost to the ministry of the Word and prayer. The church needs deacons to prioritize ministry so that that can be true of the pastor and so that the gospel can be kept front and center in our church and in our community. But fifthly and finally this morning, the church needs deacons from verse 7 to ensure gospel penetration. Listen to again what verse 7 says resulted from the establishment of the ministry of deacons. So... Because we did this, because the apostles set up the ministry of deacon, so the word of God spread. This is a result of the establishment of the ministry of deacon. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So don't miss this. The church needs deacons to ensure gospel penetration into our community and to the ends of the earth. Because of the ministry of deacons that enabled a ministry prioritized for the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the Word of God, the Word of God spread, the number of disciples multiplied, and a great number of even priests came to know Jesus. A church that functions according to God's wise design that includes a lively deacon family ministry will grow and flourish and impact its community and the world for Christ. The church needs deacons to ensure gospel penetration. You see, men, the spirit empowered ministry of deacons is a major factor in the health and gospel growth of the body of Christ. And this is a ministry to which God's called you. It's what He set you apart for these last months. It's what we're now fixing to ordain you into. And what a privilege it is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together.